Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Mike Perry. I'm the president of the Army Heritage Center Foundation. The foundation is the friends group for the U.S. Army Heritage Education Center, the Army's premier research repository in the history and heritage of our Army and its soldiers. The center is a component of the Army War College and located in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Tonight, we're pleased to have Chloe Gavin Beatty and Colonel Retired Keith Nightingale to do a presentation on a rather important general in the history of our Army, General Gavin. Uh, they've prepared a book looking at his wartime diaries uh, that, that began uh, when he was with the 82nd and went through the end of the war. But to really understand the general, I want uh, uh, Chloe to first talk about her father, because Chloe is the last, I think the young, not the last daughter, the youngest daughter. Yes. Uh, in the Gavin family, uh, and has been one of the forces behind uh, the de development of this, this book. So, Chloe, would you like to talk a little bit about your father's early days? Sure. Um, my father uh, was born in 1907 and placed in an orphanage in Brooklyn. Catholic orphanage from which he was adopted by a coal mining family in Mount Carmel, Pennsylvania, anthracite coal region. And uh, he grew up in a pretty tough childhood. Someone once referred to it as something out of Dickens, you know, no money, no f often not enough food. Uh, he had to work uh, from an early age, sold newspapers as a seven and eight year old, uh, and he had to leave school after sixth grade to work to support uh, his adoptive parents. Uh, and I think um, what he got out of that time in Mount Carmel was first for some, you know, who knows why or how he did, he developed an intense uh, love of learning and desire to learn more about the world around him. He also, uh, decided he was not going to stay in Mount Carmel and be a coal miner, and he had to get out. He knew he wanted to get out to see the bigger world. So he uh, he eventually uh, runs away from home? Yeah, he ran away actually on his 17th birthday. I can't imagine he had more than a few dollars in his pocket. Uh, and he went to New York and enlisted in the Army. And they sent him down to Panama. Uh, and so he started life in the army as a private. Um, and while he was down in Panama, he uh, was very interested in you know, the history of what was around him. And he studied the history and would go tour the Spanish fortifications and wanted to know more. And a sergeant noticed him and said, you know, your officer material, you really should take the competitive exam to get into West Point. So he uh, had six months to prepare to make up for missing seventh grade through 12th grade. And he took that exam and managed to squeak into West Point. Um, and, uh, you know, while he was uh, at West Point, he had to really work awfully hard to keep up academically because he was so unprepared. Um, but he did, uh, he graduated and um, went off uh, as a young officer stationed around the country and in the Philippines. Um, and one of the stories that you know rings true, General Norton who served under him in uh, uh, World War II was saying that when they were together in the Philippines, you know, he he lived with my dad, and they, my dad had subscriptions to every army journal and history journal you could think of, and he was constantly reading military history, trying to improve himself as an officer. And then, in around 1940, he gets assigned to the military academy again. Yes, he was a attack, um, and uh, he was there, but he had been following developments over in Europe. And when the war broke out, he applied to join the Airborne, which was then obviously very new and was initially denied. 
Uh, and then he just kept working at it and trying to figure out how to get there. And he got himself a sign. Okay. So in August of 1941, Captain Gavin, so it's, and, and look at the, remember the dates as we go through some of these dates here. It's August of 1941, Captain D Gavin is accepted to airborne school and into the airborne community. Colonel Nightingale, could you discuss what it was like uh, as a young airborne trooper when they first established the school? Well, talk about a compressed career and accelerated promotion. I'd make the point that in August 1941, he shows up as a leg, if you would, at Fort Benning. And in August of 1942, he ends up being a full colonel in charge of the 505 at Fort Bragg. So the, the, the lesson here is be prepared for opportunity if it presents itself. Uh, he showed up at Fort Benning and was immediately assimilated into what General Lee had created uh, as part of the Airborne Training Command. Uh, the original parachute test platoon was already underway, and he joined all of the other numbered regiments that were just beginning to be created, the 501st through the 509th, all as independent parachute regiments. Uh, he immediately set himself aside as being a unique individual, both physically as well as intellectually. He became, he was noted by General uh, Lee as being exceptionally smart and astute. And when he went through airborne school, Lee immediately grabbed him and brought him up to the parachute command. And it was there in the parachute command, the airborne command, which was basically just developing. Nobody ever knew what airborne was. We only had the experience of looking at what the Germans did in Ebene Mail and in Crete. And he immediately became kind of the intellectual catalyst for General uh, Lee. And Lee tasked him with writing the airborne operations and training manual. In other words, what, how does airborne operate? Uh, nobody knew up to that time. It was a completely new, unique experience. Uh, the troops that came in uh, had volunteered from all over the U.S. to join the Airborne. As one of the vets would tell me, because they liked the addition, it was double pay. They joined the Army for 55 bucks, and they got 55 bucks additional to jump out of an airplane. So that's what they wanted to do. And the publicity was uh, very you know, one of pride and uniqueness and the, uh, the leading edge of warfare, if you would. And that would appeal to a lot of people. These troops came in and then Captain and soon to be Major uh, Gavin would take them up and run them through airborne training. And this was actually four weeks at the time because the last week was uh, uh, parachute packing. You learn not only how to jump, but you also learn how to pack your parachute. That was an essential piece. Uh, when the Army made the decision to create an airborne division as opposed to just independent regiments, they didn't really know how to employ them or what they were going to do. But uh, General Marshall was pretty certain that we would need divisions. So he established the 101st and the 82nd as the first two airborne divisions. Now, were these divisions pure parachute regiments or did they have a mix of something uh, else? The initial uh, creation was for one parachute regiment and two glider regiments. That quickly went by the wayside uh, and, and, and into two airborne regiments and one glider regiment. Uh, then uh, Lieutenant Colonel Gavin went with General Lee to Fort Bragg where they started the conversion of the 82nd Division into an airborne division. And the 505 was then established as the base parachute unit for the 82nd. And at that point, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Gavin was then made a colonel and the commander of the 505 PIR. And that's where he began his whole program. Uh, and the division commander initially was the division again. commander is initially of the 82nd. Uh, he went into the 82nd as the commander of the 505. 
uh, that was a brand new organization. And I would say this is a critical point because he developed a symbiotic relationship with General Ridgway that carried throughout the war. Uh, Ridgway recognized him for his unique qualities as both a trainer and as a intellectual leader in terms of airborne doctrine and tactics. And Ridgway stepped back to run the division and he put Ridge, uh, Gavin in charge of actually the development and the training and the specific tactical operations of the division. And that uh, remained with them throughout uh, Ridgeway's tour as the commander of the 82nd. What type of trainer was he? Uh, because nobody really knew what an airborne unit did, I think General Gavin, at least based on his comments and conversations with me, focused naturally on the lowest level, the cutting edge, you know, what actually makes a difference in combat. Uh, historically in our army, there was a clear separation, almost a class between the officer and the enlisted. General Gavin saw that would be a mistake. He's actually, as a captain, he thought it would be a mistake if, if you read what he wrote. And he said, you know, what counts is the NCO. It's a small unit. It's the junior officer, the junior leader. And that's what he did at Fort Benning. He was always out front. And this was very unusual for officers at that time. They didn't usually lead from the front. First in PT, you know, first out the door, last in the chow line. Uh, all these kind of basic precepts that we accept as the MO today for airborne, he invented and he carried it through. And he did that uh, also through his selection of other officers. I mean, he evaluated officers at Fort Benning and at Fort Bragg and saw what their strengths and weaknesses were and if they were a fit for his sort of organization or not. So what you had by the time they, before they, just before they went to North Africa, he had established a cadre from the platoon leader up to the regimental commander that was his model and mold, which was upfront emphasis with the troops, strong NCO Corps, emphasis on small unit tactics and the or officers resourcing them and leading them when necessary, but not interfering with how the actual uh, combat operations undertook. Now, even though we, these were airborne troops, he expected them to walk a lot, dude. Didn't he have a, a rather strong reputation as a guy uh, who was marches? He did. Uh, one of his all hallmarks of physical training was long road marches, which everybody hated. You know, you can imagine a road march in August at Fort Bragg uh, in, you know, all of that temperature. And he led the way. Uh, truly. Uh, and he in, ensured that his subordinate officers also led the way. Uh, and it was rainy and cold and full of lightning and hail. He was also out front, uh, which, of course, encourages subordinates to do likewise. And over time, that develops an ethos. You know, so you see he actually had two parts to what he brought to Airborne. One was just the basic uh, concept of how you train, develop, and lead in an airborne unit. And the other one was the intellectual aspects of it. How do you employ an airborne division? You know, what are the issues you have to consider? Like for the first time, you know, tactical aircraft, the C-47, the troop carrier wings, these guys had to be integrated. How do you integrate airborne artillery, something nobody else had? How do you use the glider forces as a force multiplier with the airborne? These were all things that he was dealing with every day, you know, almost in a, a two-part persona. Uh, and he was fine, you know, he's able to do this over time uh, because he and Ridgeway had such a great relationship uh, that, you know, each took on their own role and, you know, both were very successful in doing it. But the core of what we call today the airborne persona and the basic airborne uh, methodologies was born, you know, primarily through him and his first force of personality. Uh, the unit 82nd is alert for deployment. They move into North Africa and then they prepare for uh, the first combat jump in, into Sicily. Uh, 
what did they what did what was his experience on that jump and what did he learn from that about how airborne troops might be employed well we had several conversations about that and you know if you have to go back to the original concept uh which was actually it was going to be two regiments it was going to be the 505 initially reinforced by the 504 and what happened was that the winds were very high uh in sicily uh on on there was no well, we'll go back to step one. There was no real prior training between the troop carrier wing and the 82nd. It was very catch as catch can. Uh, at that time, navigational aids were marginal to non-existent. Radar didn't exist. It was all what the pilot saw on a map and his own ability to work a stopwatch. Uh, and as a result, the 505 was grossly scattered. I mean, less than 30% of the people actually landed where they were supposed to be. General Gavin, that time Colonel Gavin, landed about 20 miles from where he was supposed to be. The 504 never showed up because they were shot down by the Navy before they could get there. General Ridgway landed with the 325 on Gela essentially a day and a half after uh, the initial assault was made. Uh, this was the beginning of what we now call the LGOT concept, little groups of paratroops. Because of the hard work that the regiment had done in North Africa and at Fort Bragg, uh, the individual soldier, PFC Schmuckatelli, or Sergeant X or Lieutenant Y, picked up where they landed on the ground, figured out where they were, and went off to kill Germans and go to the uh, what they knew to be the primary objectives. And they did that very well, at least sufficiently for the war. Uh, this photograph is quite important. This is a photograph of, of then Colonel Gavin with a newspaper reporter by the name of uh, Beaver Thompson, who was a correspondent for the uh, Chicago Tribune, one of the major newspapers in the United States. And uh, Thompson had been uh, looking at the 82nd and Gavin uh, in North Africa. And he was naturally attracted to Gavin's persona. And he became kind of fixated on the regiment. And he just came up to Gavin one day in North Africa and says, hey, can I join you guys in Sicily? Thompson had zero. He'd never been to jump school before. And so... Gavin offered him a parachute and said, hey, sure, join me. And so Thompson put on a parachute and made his first jump as a combat jump <laughs> with Gavin in Sicily. And he came back and he wrote this glowing article about the 505, the 82nd, and General Gavin, or Colonel Gavin in particular. And it was the first time the American public heard about airborne. And boy, they were really mesmerized because uh, Thompson's story was picked up by Time Magazine, and Time Magazine started to do article, and then Life Magazine had an article, and all of a sudden, the 82nd Airborne and Jim Gavin in particular were highlighted to the American public, made a huge difference to the attitude of the public and what they were focusing on. Uh, in, the first few, in the first few days, though, Colonel Gavin was nothing more than, not nothing more, so it was a horrible way. He said he was That's Private probably. Gavin. Huh? His comment to me was that for the first 48 hours, he was basically Private Gavin. Uh, and it wasn't until he got to Biaza Ridge that he was actually able to exercise himself as the regimental commander. Uh, At Biaza Ridge, his unit is, is attacked by uh, heavy German forces, including some Tiger tanks. What, what did he yes. learn from that particular? Uh, well, I think there were two, there were two major uh, learning points, if you would, uh, as he expressed them to me. One was that we, the Airborne, needed to do a tremendously better job on land navigation for the pilots and getting them to where they wanted to go. And he looked at it as a 50-50 proposition. You know, the pilots getting them to where they wanted to go and the 82nd actually assisting them to get them where they were supposed to go. This was the birth of the Pathfinder concept. The other one was that uh, infantry is a very poor uh, 
defensive resource against armor. Uh, Biaza Ridge was the extreme end of the capability of the 82nd at that time. He had two parts. Uh, Biaza Ridge was overlooking the beaches. And the Herman Goering Division, which was a very good armored division, was crashing down on the beach. The only thing between the beach and the Germans was Jim Gavin and elements of the 3505 and some scratch elements from 1 and 2505 that had been misdropped. He spent uh, the better part of the entire day moving from position to position, bringing up anti-tank weapons, sending bazooka teams around. He said at one point he actually personally led a bazooka team around to get a flank shot on a couple of tanks. Uh, and he was able to finally manage uh, the successful defense of the position. But it taught him that he needed, the division needed uh, basic infantry combined arms support very early in the game artillery, tactical air, and in this case would save them naval gunfire. Uh, it also was the impetus between both he and General Ridgeway and being absolutely adamant that there has to be a pathfinder capability and that the 82nd would invent it. Uh, they assigned Jack Norton uh, as then as a captain who was in the three shop for Gavin as the head of the new pathfinder school in Sicily. And the troop carrier wing uh, said, hey, this is great. We want to do it. The troop carrier wing basically turned itself over to uh, Norton and said, hey, whatever you want, however you want, you know, we'll do it. And they got began to get some in, uh, material from the Brits and from inside in General Electric in the U.S., the Holofane lamps for the first Holofane lamps for the first time as well as what became the uh, Eureka and Rebecca systems for navigating uh, into the drop zones. And they trained very hard on this. And Ridgeway and Gavin were constantly there watching the training both day and night in Sicily after the invasion was successful. And they used it for the first time in Salerno and it was very successful. And from then on that was adopted as the basic uh, airborne pathfinder program for you both divisions. You mentioned combined arms. You mentioned combined arms. D didn't they have some artillery with them that was organic to the division? Yes, and and they they weren't really certain how the artillery would work. Part of the problem was delivery. You know, at that time there was no such thing as heavy drop. Uh, if it, if it, the only way you were going to get something was off of a door bundle or on a glider. So they developed what they call the Snub Nose 105, which could fit on a glider, which had a range of about 7,500 yards for uh, 105. And then they also tried to figure out uh, how to parapack the 75 millimeter pack howitzer, uh, which they worked on extensively in North Africa and later in Salerno, and they used for the first time really uh, completely in Normandy. Uh, so the problem of indirect artillery fire was always a concern for both Gavin and Ridgeway. Uh, they were saved in Sicily by naval gunfire. Uh, they were able to use later successfully the 75 in Salerno and then both the 105 and the 75 in Normandy, but that was a continuing issue for the division. As, as they, uh, after the, after the uh, Italian campaigns, when they move up to England, okay, they're working on uh, navigation for aircraft. The, uh, the Sicily jump was a, a, a day jump because they had never practiced night jumps. When did they start practicing night jumps? Uh, they practiced, well, Salerno was a night jump. Okay. Uh, that was the very first, uh, actually, no, I have to go back. Sicily was a night drop. Uh, it wasn't really programmed to be that way, but uh, because of a whole bunch of problems in terms of takeoff in, in uh, North Africa, it became a night drop. Uh, Salerno was a night drop, and of course, Normandy was. 
Right. Uh, back in England, with the lessons from Sicily and Salerno, they began a very aggressive program of night operations. Uh, in my conversations with both Ridgeway and Gavin, they were very clear that D-Day was going to be a night drop. They knew that going in. And so they spent a lot of time with Pathfinder control and also uh, with basic night jumps. They had to stop the night jumps because of the injuries. They were losing too many officers and NCOs. So they substituted the deuce and a half truck as the C-47, and they intentionally misdropped soldiers in on UK areas so they would get used to being in the wrong place and mentally organizing themselves for that. Uh, is, he's doing this now as he once he gets up to England, he's elevated to the ADC, the Assistant Division Commander. Yes, uh, when uh, they moved to England. Uh, he was promoted to the to Brigadier General, the youngest Brigadier General in the Army, uh, as the ADC of the 82nd, and her bachelor became his replacement in the 505 PIR. Uh, at this point, Gavin changes his nature of his command, if you would. He's no longer looking down at the tactical level. He and Ridgeway are spending their time evaluating these two new parachute infantry regiments, the 507th and the 508th, both of whom were independent, had arrived in England and were assigned to the 82nd uh, to compensate for the loss of the 504th, which was uh, dragooned in Italy by General Clark and wouldn't arrive on time. Uh, as a result, if you, you read his diary in, in Chloe's book, you'll see that he spent most of his time looking at the leadership of these two new parachute infantry regiments. You know, what are the commanders like? What are the subordinates like? What is the quality of the training? Are they emphasizing the right thing? Because these two units grew up independently of the 82nd and the 505. They, had, they were doing their own thing at Fort Bragg and Fort Benning. So they arrived uh, basically with whatever their culture was in England. And a lot of the things that both uh, Ridgeway and Gavin saw did not sit well with them. Uh, the senior commanders were lazy and unengaged. The junior officers weren't leading out front. Uh, a lot of things needed to be fixed in their mind before they had a high level of confidence uh, in employing them. And both Gavin and Ridgeway, Gavin in particular, spent a lot of time counseling uh, the senior leadership of these two regiments. In fact, they, he, they basically fired several people uh, before they got the right touch. You answered my question. I said, did they relieve many? The senior yes. Uh, and uh, among said, other people, they relieved Bachelor from the 505. Uh, you know, their own, the guy that they had hoped would be a good replacement for Gavin uh, did not do so well. Uh, and as a result, they brought in uh, Colonel Ekman, who was a, a non-regimental guy, non-division history. Uh, by Ridgeway brought him in to bring in new blood, and he did very well. But that's just one example of, uh, you know, the uh, adjustments that they made in the officer corps to get what they wanted. Now you talked about using do, uh, uh, two and a half tons to disperse uh, soldiers across the battlefield. When they go into uh, uh, into Normandy on D-Day, for what I read, the uh, the drop zone was about four times larger than they expected. Uh, well, it was worse. It was worse than that. Uh, elements of the 507th were dropped actually on the outskirts of Cherbourg, more than 35 <laughs> miles from the 507th projected, you know, drop zone. Uh, troops from the 101st landed at Omaha Beach. Uh, this was the birth of the LGOP as we know it today, the little groups of paratroops. But this also was sort of the heart of what uh, Gavin had inculcated within the division, which is basically uh, every soldier knows what the division objective is and the, re and the regimental objective. And so you had all of these groups of troops that were grossly misscattered. 
uh, 507th and the 508th were just all over the map uh, and completely ineffectual as regiments per se. Uh, but their soldiers picked themselves up, gathered themselves, figured out where they were. They understood uh, what the larger mission was uh, and then moved on to do great work. Uh, and this was all something never happened before. You know, how can a PFC suddenly figure out what the battalion or regimental mission is? And they did because Gavin insisted that they know. Uh, in a sense, in today's term, they would call it mission command and commander's vision. That this uh, was something that Gavin and Ridgeway inculcated in his units. Absolutely. Uh, he, uh, one of his big deals was sand tables and briefings, uh, something that, again, was a rather new technique where they would create models on the ground of where they were supposed, where the unit was supposed to be. And this would go all the way from the division down to the company level. And the troops would walk through and they would be drilled on the entire thing. So PFC Schmuckatelli, who was supposed to land here and do this with, uh, you know, his first platoon, A company, would also know what the regiment was doing. So when he was landed way out of his area, he knew enough about what was going on to actually figure out what needed to be done. He had the confidence that he could do it and went off to do it. Uh, you know, I can't tell you how many vets I talked to uh, over time that said that time with the sand tables and the briefings was extraordinarily important to them in the first 48 hours of D-Day because they knew what the big picture was, they knew what their portion of the small picture was, and they were completely confident in their ability to go forth and do good. Now, in August of 44, three years after Captain Gavin shows up with the uh, the Airborne, he is now the division commander of the 82nd. Uh, as, as he moved up, did he modify his leadership style or did he still uh, exude the same type of leadership that he did when he was a young captain or major? Well, I think it was a hybrid. Uh, he, in he insisted and he observed enough to ensure that all of his subordinate officers had the same basic MO that he supported. Uh, you know, first out of the door and last in the chow line, et cetera. Emphasis in small units, emphasis on NCOs. So he, he, was, he made certain that the officers that he had were in his model. Uh, but he also spent more time now as the division commander worrying about issues, employment of the division, right or wrong. You know, people were always coming in senior to him with really bright ideas. Uh, and they had no re no basis in experience. And he had to figure out how to uh, divert those into, you know, the trash bin without being too impolite. Uh, and also in developing the resources. He continued his emphasis on the necessity for the Pathfinder operations with the troop carrier wings. Uh, you know, one thing he was really big on uh, when he became the division commander was continuous training between a given troop carrier wing and a given parachute infantry regiment. So they developed the same relationship that he had with the 505 and his troop carrier wing that brought them initially into Sicily, not so well, Salerno great, and Normandy perfect. Okay. And, you know, this is a good example. Uh, go back to the map, if you would, for a moment. Okay. Uh, of what happened on D-Day to give you an example. You see Ridgeway CP there by St. Mary Glees. The 505, which was just slightly to the left of that, was the only regiment that landed where it was supposed to. Uh, the 08 and the 07 were grossly misscattered. Uh, you know, it goes to the command control communications uh, issue and why it was so essential that they train the troops as they did to work without direct communications. General Ridgeway told me that for the first 18 hours of D-Day, the only thing that he knew as a division commander was what he saw visually 
or what somebody told him in person. He had no radios whatsoever. Yet he was able to get a reasonably decent picture of the chaos, if you would, uh, as time unfolded. And it wasn't a major problem in retrospect because the troops did so well on their own without guidance. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't a problem of over control. It was gross under control, but the troops had it in hand, which is, you know, exactly what they do today. Well, you said this is one of your favorite pictures. What is this of? Uh, uh, this, go ahead, Chloe. Yeah, this is my dad getting ready to uh, go into Holland, putting on his equipment on the airfield and getting ready to go. So this is Sunday. preparation for Operation Market Garden. Yeah, Sunday, September 17th, okay. 1944. Youngest you. commanding what general in the Army. Say again? Youngest commanding general in the Army, and he looked it. This particular picture got a lot of publicity uh, for two reasons. Number one was his youth, and the other one was the M1 rifle. Uh, you'll see it down there at his feet. What's uh, unusual? What's unusual about him carrying an M1 rifle, Colonel Nightingale? Well, the sidearm for an officer, certainly a very senior officer, would have been a 45. I mean, with uh, at the senior officer level, you don't expect to use a weapon uh, other than in self-defense, and that probably never will occur. Uh, and I asked him about the weapon, and he said, well, look, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, if I'm carrying an M1 around, and a German is looking at me, he'll think I'm just another private, not worth a shot. On the other hand, if I actually need to use the weapon, he's got the right one on hand to use. Okay. So as, as they begin uh, Operation Market Garden, the operation was a little bit less successful than they had hoped. What observation in his diary did he have about why they didn't have the success they were expecting? Uh, well, there are several components, and he said he didn't really recognize the issue uh, until actually he got on the ground, uh, which was basically space and time. Uh, the division was scattered through a much wider area than normally tactically would have been allowed by Fort Benning. Uh, he said he had to basically place the uh, two parachute regiments, the uh, 08 and the 05 uh, and the 04 into uh, outpost positions. They were not able to tie together defensively. The intelligence was terrible. And he said that was one of the major problems that they dealt with going in is they didn't have decent intelligence in terms of both the German capabilities as well as the German intentions. Uh, the fierce uh, defense they got in the Nijmegen area, plus the German counterattacks coming in in strength from uh, Beak and Grossbeak were very much unexpected. Uh, Gavin told me that he spent most of his time running a fire brigade, filling a hole here, filling a hole there, filling a gap, accepting a gap in some other location. Uh, the point being here is that he understood intelligence was really the sine qua non for the, for the 82nd because they couldn't afford a mistake. They couldn't jump in at a basically a force limiting situation where the opposition was so much stronger than they were, which, of course, is what happened to Frost uh, up further to the north. The other was the absolute necessity to link in with conventional ground forces very soon after the drop to compensate for the gross spread that his division had to take under. He said, you know, if Horrocks had shown up within 48 hours, the division would have been much better off and taken much less casualties. Uh, he needed the... Uh, British artillery there. He needed the British armor to compensate for what the 82nd couldn't do. Uh, you know, and he said he was sacrificing packets of troops because they had no alternative. Uh, they were holding ground that they were not really capable of holding, but they did it simply because of the fierce energy 
of the soldiers that he had and the ability and the flexibility of the units to shift around and take whatever minor advantage they could and from I, the Germans. I guess from your comments, he, he won, was very much involved as a direct leader. He wasn't sitting back as a manager. He was still up he was He was definitely up front. <laughs> You know, his Jeep probably put on three times the mileage of anything that uh, Ford Motor Company would have recommended. And then uh, after the after Market Garden, they're pulled back, they're reconstituted, they go through some training, and then the Germans decide in December for a Christmas present and, and, and begin the bulge. This is a picture of him, I think, Chloe, you said, uh, somewhere in the Ardennes. Yes. So... Uh, what did he do to make the 82nd effective and what lessons did he learn from the Battle of the Bulge as far as uh, airborne troops is concerned? Well, I mean, this was the ultimate exercise in flexibility. Uh, they arrived in Werbemont uh, on the 18th of December totally uh, without knowledge of what the German problem was. They knew there had been a breakout and that the 82nd and 101st were being dispatched. Now also remember at this time, he was both the Corps commander as well as the division commander. General Ridgway was stuck in the fog back in England. So Gavin as the acting Corps commander had already deployed the 101st forward and then the 82nd in trail. They had no real information as to where they were gonna go or what they were gonna do or the nature of the Germans attacking. They were grossly unprepared in terms of personal equipment and weaponry. Uh, both divisions were about maybe two thirds uh, at best at strength. The rest of them were all either in hospitals or had gone to R&R &R or in other locations and didn't make the trucks. Uh, most of the weapons, particularly the cruiser weapons uh, were in ordnance. Uh, none of the winter gear had yet been issued to them because there was no plan to employ either di airborne divisions in the bulge at the time that the requirement suddenly came about. So Gavin deployed uh, to Werbemont uh, in trail of the 101st. He directed the 101st to Bastogne, and he would follow in behind, and they would go to Werbemont. And they showed up about 4 o'clock in the afternoon on the 18th. And it was like 20 below zero. Uh, and the troops were totally frozen. And he had minimal information that he was able to get from the Corps commander, General Hodges, at that time. And he just began distributing his people along what was called the Skyline Road. Uh, and with the furthest most element being the 2505 at Troy Pont. And he was just going to hold this line and then let, you know, as you know, we say, get sorted out in the drop zone figure out what the intelligence was, where the Germans were, and how he could shift lines. Well, he had the entire division essentially on an area that would be uh, accompanying a core, if you would, uh, grossly distributed well beyond their normal tactical doctrinal uh, distances. Uh, so he spent his time uh, going from unit to unit figuring out where the best defensive terrain was and figuring out how to deploy his units and more importantly, to support them because the normal division tail hadn't caught up yet. The uh, structure uh, of the initial reinforcements was so fast that the normal stuff that would show up like artillery and medics and quartermaster and supply and commo and all that stuff uh, wasn't there. It was all light infantry. And he had to, he felt he had to personally lead his guys, meet the regimental commander, go down to the battalion commanders and occasionally to the company commanders to show his face, give them confidence in what they were doing because they knew it was an incredible stress. I mean, the point he made several times was this was a survival exercise. So, so you, 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 you anticipated my question is, is he believed again, very visible command down to, down to the subordinate levels? Absolutely. Uh, the thing that struck him was the 
freezing weather that his troops had to deal with. And, you know, they're in their summer combat uniforms. They're, they have very little winter gear at all. Uh, and he recognized this was a survival deal. Well, you know, he had, he had a kind of a two-part problem. He had to convince the soldier that he could survive under these conditions. And then he had to give the soldier confidence that he could beat the Germans, who were basically a SS, full-up, first-class German force, uh, you know, quite formidable. And he was able to do that with force of personality. Uh, and this just bled over to all of his other subordinate commanders. Uh, you know, if he showed up at a company CP or a platoon OP and there were some problems there, well, very soon there was a company commander, a battalion commander, and a regimental commander there fixing it. And the vet said, hey, that was a huge effect. Hey, if this colonel is up here to see what I'm doing, you know, I'm going to do my job. And, you know, I'll figure out how to deal with it, the weather and all that. Uh, if they got confidence in me, I got confidence in them. Um, eventually, the German forces defeated, and he winds up the war commanding Berlin. Uh, in the diary, uh, did he talk about how that was a different environment all of a sudden? It's, it's no longer combat. Uh, he's an occupation force instead of, a, in, a, in a sense, not a fighting force. Did he have to adjust again? Uh, very much so. Uh, in, in the journal, as, as Chloe might point out, and you know, in, in my conversations, uh, he took on much more of a sort of a political management role. Uh, his issues were different. He didn't have to train the division in how to fight. Uh, his primary focus, directed, uh, was how to deal with the Russians. Uh, you know, all the political issues. Do I put my soldiers here? What's our agreement with the with the Russians for joint whatsoever? Uh, all these social engagements. He was also, the, the division was the guard of honor, if you would. So all of the politicians and other generals and all are showing up to Berlin. Uh, you know, Eisenhower shows up, Patton shows up. Uh, congressional delegation show up, Marshall, you know, and he's trying to deal with all of this stuff, and, you know, manage them at the same time, manage the reality of what you, you call the peace, the peacetime battlefield in Berlin, you know, slicing up the territory, figuring out who's going to control what, uh, the POW camps, the DPs were a huge issue, all these displaced personnel, they had to be fed, uh, and sheltered, and this was something that was totally unprogrammed and was not part of the normal military requirement, but suddenly he's got to deal with half a million people that have no food and no place to stay, and he's the guy that's in charge of making something good happen. Well, he, uh, as a daughter reading his diary, because the diary mostly comes from the time he joins the 82nd till Berlin, what did you take from his diary? What what lessons did you draw? What important things did you see as you read his, his, his diary? Well, that's a big ask. Um, <clears throat> well, first, as I read it, I just smiled to myself because I could hear his voice coming through. You know, I mean, um, I was, you know, when Keith first read the diary, he said, you really have to publish this. There are so many lessons in leadership here. And as I've read it and reread it through the public publishing process, um, I agree that there are just very interesting and uh, important comments on uh, military leadership and leadership in general. Um, and, you know, I mean, what he did was impressive. I mean, he had intellectual flexibility, he had physical courage. He had incredible determination. And, uh, you know, you can see his personality shining through that diary. Colonel Langale, if you gave this book to a young sergeant or a young lieutenant, what would you hope that they would gain out of the diary? Are you speaking to me? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the basics. Uh, know your job. Uh, 
strong NCO core, strong junior leadership uh, core, uh, senior officers focusing on the small units, uh, making sure they have the time and the resources to do what they need to do, uh, teach imagination, encourage flexibility, uh, delegation of authority, you know, beyond uh, most what anybody would accept as being comfortable is absolutely essential uh, in the airborne community. Uh, all those small things become very big on the battlefield. Uh, the 82nd never would have succeeded in Normandy if those core principles that I had just have just enunciated had not been drilled into them uh, by Gavin from Benning to North Africa to Sicily to Normandy. All of that was the model that actually made what we are today, and I think is absolutely critical to our today's airborne organization and what they presently have as their ethos. They take it as a matter of course. Hey, this is what we are. This is what we do. Well, it was no, that was not that way in 1941, 42, 43. He made it that way. You know, what we enjoy today is what he built yesterday. Uh, I think, Croy, this is your mom and dad. Uh, let me see. Uh, yes, on okay. Beacon Hill. On and Beacon and Hill. Uh, after the war, he continued to serve in the in, in the army uh, for a period up into the into the fifties. Uh, and then he uh, he took on, even though he he continued to serve even after he retired. What what type of things did he do? I think. Whoops, that's. I'm going to show this one first. This is uh, him at Kennedy's inauguration, and then yes. he's standing next to a tall Frenchman. What, what was his role yeah. after he left the service? Uh, well, he, um, I want to circle back to the immediate post-war years, okay. but to answer your question, uh, after, his uh, after his retirement, he uh, went on to be chair of a research and development company in Cambridge and was an early supporter of President Kennedy and became Kennedy's ambassador to France because he knew General de Gaulle from the war. Um, but a lot of what he did after the war started immediately in 1946. Um, and a lot of people don't know this very much, but the Dutch certainly do. Um, he galvanized the 82nd and partnered with the city of Albany to create a massive aid effort for the city of Nijmegen. Albany had a big Dutch heritage and uh, they ran a campaign and uh, sent a cargo ship over filled with building materials and uh, clothing and other needed things. He also uh, created a group of influential and wealthy Americans to raise money to rebuild the University of Nijmegen. And they started with the medical faculty and rebuilt the entire university. And the city made him an honorary citizen. He maintained a you know, relationship with them his entire life. And, and that's how we met because you brought one of the exhibits they had uh, here to the AHEC a number of years ago. Yes, yes, an exhibit about that aid effort. Um, go back to this. This is, this is I assume, your, your sister's with your mom. And then the right-hand pictures, he has you guys jumping off the roof. Did uh, oh. he want you all to be airborne troops too? Uh, yeah, that was, uh, that's me at age five. We all went off the uh, second story uh, roof of the, it was the library there. And, you know, to me, it was perfectly normal. He says, jump. And I said, sure. Okay. He, took so off. he was trying to get all, all his kids to, to, to stay airborne troopers, right? So. Uh, no, he actually never encouraged jumping, <laughs> for real. Today, uh, he's uh, entombed at the military academy. He, he returned back to the academy, correct? Yes, uh, and he always had a deep love for West Point, and it was very important to him that he was able to be uh, buried in the cemetery there. Um. I'd like to just mention two things quickly, Mike, before oh, we yeah, end. Time is yours. Um, you know, people think of him, and we've discussed him as a 
general and as a combat officer. And he was superb at that. But he had a lot of different sides. And one of them was organizing and pushing the aid efforts for the city of Nijmegen. Okay. Um, another one was that he uh, was very uh, supportive of Afro-American soldiers in the army and uh, created a group called the 555, known as the Triple Nickel, who uh, were African Americans and they received jump training, which was highly unusual in the army at that time. And uh, they were not able to be fully integrated into the division until I think it was 46. 47. 47, but he integrated them ahead of schedule. And mm -hmm. actually the last person to see him alive was a retired postman who'd been in the 555 okay. and sought him out mm -hmm. and, and saw him in the um, hospital. And I spoke with him. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing he did when he was, he was head of research and development in the Pentagon, and push for the development of the Redstone and Saturn rockets. And those led directly to the development of the rockets used in the uh, US space program. And he was always fascinated with that. And, you know, I remember as a child, Werner von Braun coming to visit our house in Wellesley. But um, we shouldn't forget that he was also the father of the American air assault techniques. Yes. Uh, yes. Vertical envelopment was something that he picked up as a personal uh, point uh, very early on. He saw the original helicopters uh, in World War II, which were very kind of basic, but he saw, he got the idea, he could imagine it. And then he saw it in a larger degree in the Korean War, where we used them for uh, medevacs. And then the concept got to him, well, hey, parachute helicopters, same, same. So uh, in his period when he was the head of R&D, he was the leading proponent of what became the air assault technology mm -hmm. that we use today, substituting helicopters for parachutes. So he was very much on the leading edge of, call it, vertical envelopments. Right. He read an article called uh, Cavalry, and I Don't Mean Horses. Right. In the early 60s. That was yeah. very influential. We have some comments and we have some uh, questions. A question from Ralph uh, to uh, uh, to you, Colonel Antgell. Uh, he wondered how the time with the Philippine Scouts in the 1930s, when he served in the Philippines, what uh, how did that influence his belief on small uh, unit tactics? Well, uh, my appreciation is that uh, the nature of the Philippine organizations required that the emphasis be on the small units or there wouldn't be a unit at all. Uh, the senior leaders were not as spiffy as we might hope. And so any competency had to be accomplished at the lower levels. He saw that and he spent his time with the lower levels and he could see what could be done with a little bit of emphasis and direction at that level in terms of competency. And I think that carried with him to the time when he later became, uh, you know, in charge of something larger at Fort Benning. Um, this is for, for you, Chloe. It's a question of, uh, in their diaries, there are several black line deletions. This is comes <laughs> a question from Brooks. Uh, who made those deletions? Were they made by you or were they made by General Gavin? Oh, absolutely not by me. No, my father made those. We presented the diary as I found it among his papers. Uh, Keith, this is your question, I think. What, there's a picture of him as a two-star, and his jump wings have no star, no, no, no indication of combat jumps. When did that begin? Do you know? Uh, we don't know. No, I, I, can't, I can't give you a date time group. I can tell you that he clearly, uh, before the war was over, they were using the Copper Jump Star uh, okay. as a indicator. Uh, and he made a point before he left the division of having all of the four jump uh, soldiers uh, in the division uh, 
pose for a photograph with him. He was he also had four stars. Right. Uh, yeah, it was something like for if you look from 19 from the jump in in Sicily to uh, the to Holland, that whole period of time, those thousands of soldiers, that picture has like 30 people in it total. I, it, I, I didn't put that picture up, but yes, uh, it is in the diary, the, the four jump veterans out of out of the unit. Yeah. So. Yeah, uh, it shows you the toll that combat operations took on light in, uh, light infantry units on all our infantry divisions during during the war. Uh, any closing comments? Uh, he's the father. You know, we say that uh, the core of what America's airborne is today is, to a very large degree, the result of him personally. Uh, both intellectually as well as physically. And he was able through the course of the war, beginning in Sicily, through the bulge, uh, inculcate uh, a mindset, if you would, at all levels, from generals down to privates, that reside with us today. You know, we owe him a huge debt for what he was able to leave with us today. What he did in 1941 lives with us today in you know, 2023, though most people would not recognize it or understand it who wouldn't, didn't get into this arcane history. Well, what closing comments might you have? Well, I think I'd like people to consider his life uh, as a uh, retired army officer and as a civilian and how he played such an important role in his community uh, and in the United States. Uh, and uh, he had such broad interests and great desire to help people who needed, needed aid. And uh, the other thing I think he serves as an example of is the importance of being a lifelong learner. He read voraciously, constantly trying to understand and improve his understanding. And if you want to get a copy of the book, oh, it's not going to let me do it. There we go. Well, won't let me do it. But yet there we are. Gavin at War, this is the diary that, uh, that uh, they've published. And we hope that you pick it up, especially uh, those of you who want to find out some, some more about the thoughts of a, a great army leader. Um, at this time, thank you very much for joining me. And uh, we look forward to, again, uh, having you back sometime in the future. Hope you get back up here to the AHEC. Uh, we're going to move into the other theater of war here next week on Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Uh, we're going to have Christopher Kowalski, who's going to talk about Nations in the Balance, the Burma-India campaign in 1943 and 1944. So... From one great leader who was you know, General Gavin to General Stilway, an, another well-known uh, leader from World War II. So please join us next week at 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Again, Colonel Nightingale, Chloe, thank you very much and look forward to talking to you in the future. Okay, great. Thank you, Mike. Yep, thanks. Thank you all. Do you have more questions to answer, Mike? Do I have a, some, a bunch more popped up late? If, if, if folks want to leave, that's fine. If not, I will go through the other questions because I, I can sit here until you finish with questions. Uh, I can hang. I can hang for a while. I got okay, I know. You got to go up. pick up uh, uh, a lot of it. Thanks. Okay. How did the Vietnam War affect him? He seems very passionate during it. I think the Fulbright hearings, because your your father did oppose mm. the Vietnam War. Yeah, he came out very. He, he was over there, and he looked around and said, "This is not winnable. This is not going to, you know, end well." And he came out publicly, and as you mentioned, testified uh, before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and continued to voice his opposition to the war and. Eventually, as we all know, the country came around and uh, decided the war had to be ended. But he paid a very heavy personal price for that because there were a lot of people in the army who were very unhappy that he spoke his mind. 
Yes, specifically General Taylor. Yes. Uh, uh -huh. Both General Ridgway and General Gavin were asked by Eisenhower when he was still president to make an evaluation of Vietnam as a, a potential uh, issue for the U.S. And both of them independently and collectively said, really bad idea. Uh, as we actually did have General Gavin. Ridgway's analysis in 1954 of whether we should get involved in Vietnam here in the collection. Yeah. And it uh, is interesting. It is. You have no not national interest uh, going in there, so it's uh, it's interesting to look back at some of those documents and the, their reflections uh, that preceded the, the nation's uh, decide decision to, to leave Vietnam. Uh, a lot of them are just great thank yous for for joining uh, for doing this tonight. They want to know where the book is available. I would say it is available on Amazon. Uh, any anywhere else? It's a casement publication. So where else might be available? We're trying to get it into the PXs, but this seems to be uphill. I know that, yes. That's why we sell books here at the AHAC. Um, <laughs> additional, uh, Andrew's asking about additional examples of his civilian and civic leadership. You've talked about what he did with the community of Nijmegen. You talk about his his other leadership things. What what else did he do on a, maybe a local basis? Was he involved in the community? Yes, he was um, on the board of trustees of the Museum of Fine Arts. And at one point they were gonna sell their portrait of George Washington and he led the drive to keep it in Boston. Um, he was, uh, he supported an orphanage unknownst to us, his family for years in Boston, um, built them a library, which of course suited him. Um, he was uh, on the, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but he was part of the planning and implementation of the US Olympic team that went over to Tokyo and he went over there with them. Um, he was a trustee at West Point. Um, he was on the American Battle Monuments Commission um that was very important to him uh he, i'm i know i'm missing a thousand things he was on multiple corporate boards as well somebody asked did you ever see his interview on boston public uh i assume it's boston public television wgbh have you ever seen that interview no when was that made they don't indicate when it was made they just said it was done in boston near the end of his life so so uh, maybe oh. contact the station and they may have something that the family hasn't seen for a while. Oh, I'd love to see that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see if we got any more. Thanks much. Um, I do have a question because he worked with, ha uh, he was approached by Al Lowenstein, my congressman when I was on, lived on Long Island, the okay. gentleman who would have nominated me for the military academy had I not gotten a different form of nomination. What was his relationship? Do you know? Have you ever seen much with, documentation? No. With Lowenstein, no. I don't know about that relationship. Because Lowenstein tried to get him to run against uh, President Johnson and, and lead the dumb Johnson movement. Uh, well, yeah, he was. He talked to people involved in presidential politics okay. who, who approached him uh, because... You know, at that point, the anti-war forces felt like something had to be done. Okay. Uh, and he, I don't think he was ever, I mean, he never wanted to have public office, but he was talking to people because he felt so strongly about the issue. Well, what I'll, I'll do, um, there are a couple more questions and more compliments. What I'll do is I'll print them off and send them to both of you so that you can see who else may have joined uh, the conversation. Somebody has asked for some email addresses. I'm not going to release email addresses. You may reach out to them if they if you wish. Uh, but again, thanks for tonight. And uh, uh, again, please come visit sometime and uh, look forward to seeing you. Good night. Okay. Thanks. You're to serve. Good night. Okay.